Okay, so we've heard quite a lot about the mobile gaming ecosystem. Um, I'm going to give you a perspective on mobile games and content. Um, I'm going to look at two markets. I'm going to look at the European market. I know that's a very big generalization, but I'm also going to look at the Japanese market and show you the differences and talk to you about how I feel some of these differences have come about. Um, a little bit about Nam Namco. Founded in 1955. So we're not a fly-by-night mobile gaming company. We've been around for quite some time. It was founded by a gentleman by the name of uh, Nakamura, first name uh, uh, Masaya. And uh, the focus was on amusement machines. So it was the Nakamura Manufacturing Company. Um, it was a very successful business, uh, but it really became an international business about 29 years ago. I'm sure everybody's heard of Pac-Man. Uh, 30 years old next year, continues to be played by tens of millions of people every year. It's inspired a lot of game genres. Some people suggest it inspired most maze-based chasing games. It's inspired public art, uh, this being a crop circle that you can find if you search for it on, uh, on Google Earth. Small things. And some people think that Pac-Man was real following the discover of this, of this uh, skeleton quite some time ago. And uh, we believe that it's backed up by a recent x-ray which we found, which clearly shows Pac-Man and his, uh, his favorite diet. So we've been quite a creative company. Um, when Mr. Iwatani created Pac-Man, he said that he was, wanted to create a game that could be played by everybody, that would appeal to females, would appeal to males alike. And um, he had this thought while eating pizza one evening in Tokyo, which is where he came up with the iconic Pac-Man shape. We're a company that's uh, synonymous with, uh, with innovation. And um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with Katamari. Um, yeah, OK. Well, that's, that's good. So again, a very creative game uh, created by uh, Kaita Takahashi. And uh, I'm going to show you just a little clip of the gameplay here. Uh, this is just some Katamari-inspired art. Yeah, I have no, sorry, I have no audio. Oh, we have audio. Okay. Whoa. Here we go. We're good. We're good. So you can see it's a game where you start off with a very small katamari, roll up things in your environment, and uh, try to create initially from a small speck of dust up to five centimeters, and then eventually you're rolling up kilometers and kilometers of, uh, of um, junk and uh, buildings and people, all sorts of things. Again, it's a, it's a game that's inspired people to do fairly crazy things. Um, at every gamers conference, you'll always find the Katamari cosplayers. Um, we, I don't have the pictures of the Katamari wedding, um, but it's, it's a pretty popular game genre. Mr. Takahashi has another game coming out uh, in a couple of weeks on the PlayStation Network called uh, Nobby Nobby Boy. And i uh, got a picture of Nobby Nobby Boy there. So again, you can expect to see some Nobby Nobby Boy cosplayers, I think, over the next, uh, over the next few, uh, few months. Um, so while I'm here to talk about mobile games, and, and you know, I think um, it's best to show you some of the things that we do in Japan. We are, as I said, an innovative, creative company. Um, so we're innovative in a mobile respect as well. I'm going to show you some Bandai content and some Namco content, and then I'm going to show you something else that we, that we do in other markets. Sorry. This is the state of the art in mobile gaming in Japan. Uh, Gundam, which is a very, very Bandai-specific license, Japan-specific license. But what you're actually seeing here is a live, uh, a, a direct screen grab off, um, off the mobile screen of uh, the Gundam game. There should be audio on that as well. So the first thing you'll see, it's quite obviously quite a cinematic game and clearly appeals to the hardcore gamer. Again, all off the mobile screen. I'm going to skip forward on this one and just show you the quality of the gameplay here. So you can see this is again a direct read from the mobile version. I have the mobile version. I have my Japanese cell phone with me here. And um, if anybody wants to see it, please come and see me after. 
interesting to note that this is actually a, a multiplayer game over the mobile network as well, not over Bluetooth. Um, and again, very, very low latency networks in the world. Uh, one of the key Namco franchises, and I'm not going to show you Pac-Man, uh, again from the Japanese market. This is one of our most famous uh, uh, franchises, which is our Ridge Racer series of games. Again, I can show you this a little bit later on my phone if anyone wants to have a look. Again, you get a sense of a very, very high quality experience, cinematic game, and, and almost a console quality type game on mobile. This is the actual in-game graphics. Sorry, the quality is a little bit poor, but there's, unfortunately we have to capture them straight off the mobile screens directly. Is the microphone okay? Sorry. A, a Panasonic P905. Uh, again, I have it here. I can show anybody afterwards. This is a little bit more complicated. This is another form of mobile gaming that we have in Japan. Now, it's actually taking a game that we have in the arcades, which are all connected to the internet, it's a game called Tekken. We connect it to Tekken Net, and you can take your Tekken character in the arcades, you can keep your profile on your phone, and buy new items, such as clothes, on your mobile phone, and the next time you go to the arcade, your character is going to have those clothes on you. You can also see, as you can see, customize your characters, um, see your network ranking worldwide, and see the status of the various bouts of Tekken. And there was some talk about location-based gaming. Now, this isn't one of our games. This is a game called Real Ghost by Tecmo. Again, I'm sorry there's no, no audio running here. This is quite an interesting one because it was one of the first games that I ever saw that used, it, that used augmented reality on any, on any platform, not just, not just mobile. So it's a little bit slow. Sorry about this. The idea with this game is it's persistent on your phone. As you're walking through Tokyo, you may receive a message. The message will notify you that there's a ghost in the area. Depending on where you are in Tokyo, you take a picture with your mobile phone. The picture will be uploaded to the server, and a ghost will be generated and placed into that picture. So it's really quite, uh, quite an interesting concept. And it's important to say this is about five or three or, three or four years old. Yeah, it's persistent. Yeah. Correct. Now, it's a number of years old. There have been a number of other iterations since, uh, since this particular version. If anything, it's gotten better. So the actual gameplay, the graphics are in line with the older phone. But what you'll see in a moment is when you take a picture, it uploads it to the server, it analyzes the picture on the server, and it places a ghost that's appropriate to the location and the uh, image. Into the, into, the, into the picture, which then it uses in your background as you're fighting the ghosts. We'll see this in a moment. It's a bit of fun. So the question is, why don't we see this in Europe? Well, the reasons we don't see this in Europe are kind of 
complex. Firstly, we have a complex value chain. Typically, in Europe, we have the rights holder, a developer, a porting house, a publisher, an aggregator, a carrier, and a consumer, or a user, or a player involved in the process. The carrier revenue shares, absolutely huge compared to Japan. I'll show you this in a moment. The opacity of the distribution process. For a publisher, it's very, very hard for us to understand what's happening with our game at any stage in the distribution process. Very hard for us to plan marketing. Very, very hard for us to uh, run promotions with consumers. There's an over-reliance on brands. How many people have seen a movie game advertised or a sequel to an older mobile game advertised? Very little scope for innovation. Content discovery has been mentioned as an issue. It's a big issue in the business. Device fragmentation is a huge issue. I'll show you this one in a moment as well, separately. And technical constraints. I, uh, I started in this business, not with Namco, um, but uh, some time ago with a different company in 2003. In 2003, we had to support six mobile phone handsets with one particular carrier. I, I won't name which one, but it's a pretty big one. Um, we had to support six handsets. In 2009, if we want to get full coverage, we have to support 450 different mobile phones. That means customizing our game for 450 phones and testing it on 450 phones and localizing it into over 11 languages. Revenue shares. In Japan, we take 90% of the end user price. In the US, we take about 70%. In Europe, under our direct contracts, we take 50%. And under indirect contracts, which is more and more common in Europe, you can see deals as low as 30%. This is a huge problem for a mobile game publisher. Any carrier that's willing to give me 90% of the end user price in Europe, I will pay 40% of that, of the difference between what I currently make marketing that content, because I cannot market my content on, 50 on a 50% on a, on a revenue share alone. And of course, as the handset market has become fragmented, we've seen the average revenue per handset you know, drop from, I won't tell you the number, but drop basically to about 30% of what it was. In Japan, it's very different. We get 90% revenue share. We get our own portal. We have a direct relationship with the consumer. Carriers just carry our data. They don't compete with us. They don't have their own games on the platform. And we have consistent devices. And there's a lot of innovation in the devices as well. In Europe, as I said, the revenue share can be as low as 30%. We, we position our games on carrier portals. We don't have a relationship with our consumers. It's very difficult for us to understand what they do. And like I said, the content providers are constantly competing with carriers for deck space. Just to give you an example of some of the issues, how we do try to get around these, and what we're trying to, how we're trying to innovate in Namco. Um, these are some of the games we put out last year on mobile. Pac-Man, we remastered it. Um, this is about as far as we can get to Japanese-style innovation. What we did with Pac-Man is we created a multiplayer version so you can play as the ghost as well as playing as Pac-Man. And we created a global high score table so you can upload your scores. But in doing that, what we're trying to do is create a little bit more value and a longer tail for the game and something that consumers can tell their friends about Pac-Man, about the multiplayer version, because there's nothing as useless as a multiplayer game that only has one player. So we're trying to get more people to buy the game and more people to play the game with the multiplayer feature and get them to upload their high scores as well. This is just a picture of the, of the high score upload space. More Brain Exercise with Dr. Kawashima is another, uh, another title we released late last year. And I'm going to show you this one, because this has been a fantastic title for us in Europe. What we've tried to do with this game is we've tried to look at how we expand the market, how we create a wider user base for mobile games, not just, not just our mobile games, but how we attract people who've never played a mobile game to play mobile games. So what we decided to do with this one was, um, i just uh, open my browser here. Yeah, so we've, um, what we have here is the More Brain Exercise Facebook uh, page. So you can actually play the game free um, on Facebook. Um, if I just click into the leaderboards. And we have a constant competition running to see who the best, uh, the best country is and the best players are across Europe. So this is actually only a, a, a day old, so there's not that many people playing in February. But you can see that um, there's already a good degree of interest on it. So what we're trying to do is get people to play the game online, get them to buy it on mobile, and then they can link their mobile account to their Facebook account and keep their, high, keep their brain exercise profiles on their profile page on, uh, on, on, on their Facebook as well. So 
So the last slide for me is about, so I want to talk about creating a healthy market. I've shown you some of the things we do in Japan, and I've shown you some of the things we're trying to do in Europe. Creating a healthy market, I think we need to lobby our mobile operators to provide us with a much more pro CP revenue share. As I've said, I will pay what I make over and marketing my content to a wider audience. We also need a more direct connection to the consumer. I need to understand who these consumers are. I need them to be able to interact directly with us as a company as opposed to a mobile carrier or an aggregator sitting in the middle. We need to see open platforms with our own hosting. And we need to see a much tighter handset management. Healthy markets enable innovation, location-aware games, connected games, 3D games, and multi-megabyte files. Original titles, not movies and sequels, will all be possible, uh, as will much stronger revenues. The iPhone actually demonstrates that this will be a possibility. With the Apple Store, Apple has a really simple model that demonstrates that the consumer will buy an unbranded game um, and that a content provider can market their content and can manage a relationship with a customer without threatening the relationship that the operator or the handset manufacturer already has with that customer. Uh, it's a simple open model, it's a great revenue share, and there's no device fragmentation, although that will probably change. An interesting statistic also picked up at the, at the recent mobile games forum was that 14% of users who have an iPhone have actually purchased a game, and that's versus under 6% of users of a Nokia N95, and that says a lot about the Apple model. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening, and um, if anybody has any questions, if I have time for questions. Yes, you do. Okay. All right. I'm going to... So if people have any questions, Mark will be there, and I'll be here. Uh, regarding the iPhone platform, um, in comparison with other mobile platforms, aren't you also worried about piracy being rampant there? I would say piracy is less of an issue on the iPhone platform than it is with the open J2ME platform. Um, firstly, you have to have a jailbroken iPhone, really, to, to load pirated games onto it. And while there are a lot of jailbroken I, you know, iPhones in markets like China and you know, in Europe, it's a small percentage to compared to being able to just Google Java games, um, get, a Bluetooth, uh, get a file and Bluetooth it across your mobile. I think it's a much more secure platform, to be honest. Piracy is a calculated risk for any, for any publisher. Marta, you had a question? Uh, looking for one. Question, question. Oh, you got one. Oh, yeah. you got two. Oh, no. I saw it. Notice first. There you go. I'm just wondering what you think. Uh, of the Google platform, the Android, do you see any possibilities there? Because it's an open platform, uh, di probably direct contact to the consumer. Yeah, I, I think, I, firstly, we're, we're supporters of the Android platform. Um, Pac-Man is available for free, um, full version for any Android, for any Android user. Um, we look at, we're a platform agnostic company, and we certainly, and personally, look very, very favorably upon open platforms. With a, with a better revenue share, as with, as with Apple, it's a 70% back, back to the publisher. But the iPhone and the Android phone, at the moment, they're just two phones. And, and unfortunately, a lot of our games are consumed by a much more mass market mobile phone, by a much more mass market audience that can't afford the price of an iPhone yet and is getting what their contract gave them. So it's, it's a great development, but there's still a long way to go. Oh, you got another one, Mark. And now trip. Oh. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Kaushik from Krish Infocom. Uh, what other off-net strategies did you have in mind? You started with Facebook. Uh, what other off-net strategies do you think uh, can be successful? I think social networking, um, as Harun said earlier on, it, and mobile games go together very well. So we have started with Facebook because if you think about something like Pac-Man, it is actually center of its own social network, as is the more uh, brain exercise with Dr. Kawashima. There are fans the, that these games can expand to other people. So we view the social networks as transports for our own social memes, so to say, um, to attract other users in. We will have our own, um, own direct-to-consumer uh, availability. In fact, in most of our games, you can 
go to get more games and, uh, and download uh, you know, other Namco titles through it. But the inconsistency of the billing platforms across Europe is, you know, is an issue. And in often cases, if we want to roll out a direct-to-consumer strategy using premium or WAP-based billing, we actually get a lower revenue share than we're redistributing via the carrier in the first place. So it's a difficult one for us. Apple had a great advantage in that Apple had all these users using iTunes to download music. So they had all these credit card numbers and all these customers that already trusted Apple and for purchases. Nobody else has that, really. So that was one of the things that gave them a very, very quick lift in this market. And it's hard for anybody else to get the consumer like that. So let's, let's wrap it up. Thank yeah. you, Barry. Thanks. Anyone who has more questions can talk to you during the bottle. <laughs>